Welcome uh, to our Know Your Bible Forum here at the Village Church, put on by the Village Church Institute. Just so glad each of you made the way out tonight on a Thursday night. I know there's lots of commitments and family things going on. My wife has something going on, so I know it's a a commitment to be here. We're grateful. Uh, I want to start off uh, the night just by reminding us the importance of being here and that we are all here because we want to know our Bible better. Uh, There's nobody in here who would say, I know my Bible uh, well enough. We're here uh, just by virtue of saying we want to know our Bibles better. Martin Luther, one of my favorite theologians, has a phrase that's really helpful to me. He says, uh, the Bible is shallow enough for the smallest of infants to play in, but it's also deep enough for the largest of elephants to wade in. And so whether you're a new believer, somebody that uh, I can remember before I came to Christ, I had a Bible that sat on my night shelf or my nightstand, and I was terrified to open it because I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to start or how to read it. Uh, And now, after years of, of theological education and pastoral ministry, I'm still saying, I don't know my Bible as well as I'd like to know it. And so I know that that's true of all of us here. And that's just really a great thing, that we want to know our Bibles better, not just so that we have more intellectual information and knowledge, but so that we can worship God and know him as he's revealed himself. So let me just uh, introduce a few things real quick. First, my name is JT English. I'm the pastor of the Village Church Institute. Uh, We put on forums like this about once every six months or so. And the, the topics that we try to pick are topics that we think are essential for every single person in our church to know about. So know your Bible. We want every Everybody to know about. It. In the fall, we're doing a, we're doing a, a forum with Afshin Ziafat from Providence Church on how we can engage Muslims with the gospel. And then later in the year, we're bringing in Andy Crouch on how uh, we're actually being discipled by technology and how technology fits in with how we can think about being Christians and being uh, family members. It's really going to be a great forum. So just have those kind of in the back of your mind. We'll give you the dates later. Um, let me just tell you real quick about the structure of the night. So we're going to be able to hear from two of my favorite Bible teachers, Jen Wilkins and Matt Chandler. Uh, So Jen is going to spend the first 45 minutes of our forum talking about the why of biblical literacy and why we should want to know our Bibles better. Matt will spend the next 45 minutes talking about how that can happen. What are some really basic principles that all of us can use on how to know our Bibles better? And then we'll do about a 25 or 30 minute Q&A. We've decided not to take any formal breaks because it can be hard to get out and get back in, but you're all adults. If you need to go use the bathroom, go use the bathroom. If you need to go get some coffee, go get some coffee. But we just wanted to be sensitive to your time and try to work through the material uh, in a reasonable fashion. Related to the question and answers, let me just uh, show you this little slide up here real quick. We want to be able to interact and engage with the actual questions that you have. So if there's a question that you have about something that's said or presented or you came here with a specific question, you can go to sli.do slash the village, just the website and ask a question there or vote for somebody else's question. So it's something you can kind of do interactively throughout the night. And we want to try to engage your question in the last 25 or 30 minutes of the night. So let me pray for us and we'll introduce and bring up Jen Wilkin. Father, we are just grateful, grateful for the opportunity to be at a church Uh, first and foremost, that believes in the authoritative word of God. It preached and it revealed to us. I just pray that tonight that we wouldn't just be here for intellectual purposes, but we'd be here primarily as an act of worship. We want to know you better. And so we pray that your spirit would be amongst us, teaching, nourishing, guiding, and illuminating the word so that we can walk out of here, not just simply knowing more information about the Bible, but knowing the God of the Bible. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Please welcome Jen. Hello, how's everybody doing? Um, I'm sure that for the young moms in the room, knowing that everyone in here can go to the restroom uh, on their own steam and by their own volition is a, a, an upside to being here tonight. It's not always something you can rely on, so I hope you enjoy that. I am so excited to get to talk about my favorite thing in my favorite place. I uh, travel around a fair amount talking about some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. In fact, as I was getting ready to be here tonight, I went back and counted, and uh, since September, I have spoken at over 20 different events, uh, conferences, women's events, things like that, uh, talking about things like we're going to talk about tonight, but I love to get to talk about these things among the people who I get to spend time with on a regular basis, among the people who are part of my own church and my own community, so this is a, this is a good night for me. And so when I travel uh, 
When I'm at an event on the weekend, typically I'm, I'm doing like three sessions, so I'm standing on a platform talking a whole lot, and then I, in between the sessions, I'm meeting and talking to women and hearing about ministry and things that, uh, questions that they have, and so basically the whole time that I'm traveling, I'm talking. And the thing is, is I'm actually kind of an introvert. And so when I get done with those events and I get to the airport and get on the plane, let's just say that when I'm sitting in my seat to fly home, I'm really not wanting a divine appointment. I don't want Chatty Cathy to sit down next to me and just yuck it up the whole time. And so I kind of get in my seat and I hunker down. And you know, I learned recently that people are actually putting headphones in their ears and listening to nothing. It's just so no one will talk to them. So I've started trying that a little bit. And so um, a couple of years ago, I was returning from an event and there had been a long wait at the airport, the flight was delayed and I just wanted to get home to my family. I was really tired and I got on the plane and I sat down and on the plane, it comes this guy, he's probably about 10 years younger than me and he has clearly spent the wait time for the flight to take off in the airport bar. And he's coming down the aisle and he's, he's like talking to everyone as he goes past and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, no, 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 no. <laughs> Sits down right next to me and he starts chatting me up, right? And the plane takes off and then they bring that little cart by and he continues to avail himself of the services, and it becomes apparent to me increasingly that if the plane loses cabin pressure, it will be my responsibility to secure (laughs) his oxygen mask. (laughs) He's a super nice guy, though, and he's chatting me up, he's telling me his whole life story, and um, the thing is, is that the longer this goes on, and the happier, so to speak, that he gets, the more I'm anticipating the moment when he turns to me and says, so what do you do? And that's when it just gets weird, right? And so I'm waiting and waiting, and eventually, because he, he's actually a really great, great guy, he turns to me and he says, so what do you do? And so I take the breath and I go, well, actually, I'm a, I'm a Bible teacher. <laughs> and he leans back a little and he looks at me and he says, huh, I bet you know all 12 commandments. <laughs> Nope, (laughs) I cannot say that I do, I cannot say that I do. And yeah, it's a funny story, right? It's a funny story until I tell you the rest of the story. And the rest of the story is this, that in all of the things that he told me about his life, one of the things that he told me was that he was a product of a Christian education. He had spent 12 years going through Christian school. And he had since left the faith But somewhere in the midst of 12 years of Christian education, he emerged thinking that there were 12 commandments. Something is wrong. Something is wrong. I'm gonna read to you from an article called The Scandal of Biblical Illiteracy, It's Our Problem. It's written by Dr. Al Mohler, who's the president of Southern Seminary in Louisville. Here's what he says. Researchers George Gallup and Jim Castelli put the problem squarely. Americans revere the Bible, but by and large, they don't read it. And because they don't read it, they have become a nation of biblical illiterates. How bad is it? Researchers tell us that it's worse than most could imagine. Fewer than half of all adults can name the four gospels. Many Christians cannot identify more than two or three of the disciples. According to data from the Barna Research Group, 60% of Americans can't name even five of the 10 commandments. No wonder people break the 10 commandments all the time. They don't know what they are, said George Barna, president of the firm. Multiple surveys reveal the problem in stark terms. According to 82% of Americans, God helps those who help themselves is a Bible verse. Those identified as born-again Christians did better by 1%. A majority of adults think the Bible teaches that the most important purpose in life is taking care of one's family. Some of the statistics are enough to perplex even those aware of the problem. A Barna poll indicated that at least 12% of adults believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. Another survey of graduating high school seniors revealed that over 50% thought that Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. 
A considerable number of respondents to one poll indicated that the Sermon on the Mount was preached by Billy Graham. <laughs> We are in big trouble. This generation must get deadly serious about the problem of biblical illiteracy or a frighteningly large number of Americans, Christians included, will go on thinking that Sodom and Gomorrah lived happily ever after. Now, the original publication date on this article is Tuesday, June 29th, 2004. This article is 13 years old. My question to you is, in the intervening 13 years, do you think that this problem has gotten better or worse? I think you're right. I think you're right. If you look at the landscape of the typical church, you see a dying Sunday school model, which is neither good nor bad, but it does mean that there is something that can typically get set aside when those environments go away. So I think what we've seen are vanishing learning environments that are dedicated specifically to making sure that followers of Christ know their sacred text. So I think that's one issue. I think there are a lot of other issues that are involved in this, but absolutely I would say that over the last 13 years, this problem has not become less pronounced. It has become more pronounced all the time that as the culture shifts around us, we are finding that the church is losing people who have only had a casual relationship with their sacred text. They have had the most basic understanding of what it says and what it does. And it's everywhere. It's everywhere, which is why that I know it's probably here in my home church that I love as well. So there was the night that I was speaking at something, and this has happened uh, on various occasions. A woman comes to me, kind of creeps over to my room after the Friday night session, and she has a question she wants to ask, and she doesn't want anyone really to know that she had the question. And so she comes to me and she says, um, I, I have a question, um, I don't understand why God would allow children to suffer because of the verse that says, suffer not the little children to come unto me. Okay, so right away, the first thing I'm thinking is, there's a question behind this question, and that's the most important part of what's gonna happen in this conversation, right? Like, a woman does not come and ask you that question unless there is a deep personal hurt or difficulty that is going on. But before I can get to the question behind the question, I'm also thinking about a couple of other problems that are in play here. The first is, as you probably know, she's quoting from the King James, right? But she's actually not quoting it accurately. What does the King James say? It says, suffer the little children to come unto me. So it's, a, it's an archaic word usage. We don't use it anymore. And what does that term? It's the scene where the children are coming to Jesus and the disciples are shooing them away. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Suffer the little children to come unto me. What does it mean? It means allow the little children to come unto me. So there was a lot going on there, right? She had an old version of the Bible. She was misremembering how it was quoted, and then she was wanting it to say something that it didn't say as a result of all of that. But here's the thing about this story. This woman was the pastor's wife. She traveled around the country leading worship. She couldn't afford for people to know what she didn't know. It's at every level. Or how about this one? I was reading in a major Christian publication, uh, an online magazine with readership in the millions, and it was an excerpt from a book that was written by a name that you might recognize, uh, a woman who was sharing um, from her life story, and she was talking about having um, decided who she, whether she should marry or not. And so she says this, one night as I was speaking at a rally of about a thousand people, before I stepped onto the stage, I prayed, Father, if I'm going to go further with this guy I'm dating, I have to know that I'm going to do more for your kingdom married than I am single. Otherwise, I've given my life to you and I just want to stay single. I have to know, do I keep dating this guy? And then she says, I sensed God's response to me out of Deuteronomy 32.30, which says, how could one man chase a thousand or two put 10,000 to flight? Then she says, God was saying to me, you can choose whichever one you want. If you don't marry this guy, this is what you will have. You'll have 1,000 like tonight. For your whole life, wherever you go, I'll use you. But one will chase 1,000 to flight, two will put 10,000 to flight. So if you do marry him, you will have a tenfold impact on my kingdom. Okay, so you know what that verse is pulled from? Do you know what Deuteronomy 32 says? 
It's actually a passage in which God is uh, basically yelling at his people. They have been disobedient, and here's the context for those verses. It says in verse 28 of Deuteronomy 32, for they are a nation void of counsel, speaking of Israel, and there is no understanding in them. If they were wise, they would understand this. They would discern their latter end. How could one have chased a thousand and two have put 10,000 to flight unless their rock had sold them and the Lord had given them up? It is a verse about God allowing the enemies of Israel to put them to flight because they have abandoned his truth. Verse 31, for their rock is not as our rock, our enemies are by themselves. For their vine comes from the vine of Sodom and from the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of poison, their clusters are bitter, their wine is the poison of serpents and the cruel venom of asps. Would you read that at your wedding? (laughs) Now, I'm a, I'm a blogger, I blog on national platforms. I know how many eyes look at a blog post before it goes up, and no one flagged this. Now, I'm a, I'm a published Christian author. I know what goes into writing a manuscript and how many eyes look at it before it gets published and goes to the Christian bookstore, and yet no one flagged this in an excerpt. So don't think for a minute that just because it got published or just because it lives on a bookshelf at a Christian bookstore, that it is being faithful to the scriptures in the way that it should be. We are in big trouble. Something is wrong. But I would guess that everybody here has some kind of regular interaction with their Bibles, right? I mean, most of us have a quiet time or time in the Word. We have something because we've been told that's what we're supposed to do and we're trying to be faithful to it. And we're hoping that if we put in the time, if we just do what we've been told to do, I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna have my 15 minutes in the morning or whatever I can carve out the time, that there will be a yield on that. And yet, why do we find ourselves, some of us, you know what I hear all of the time, the most frequent email I get, women who've started doing some of the Bible studies that I put out, and they'll say, I have been in the church my whole life, 30 years, no one has taught me how to do this. Why is that? Because we've all been doing, it's not as though we're all just pretending like we don't own Bibles. We're trying to spend time with them. Now, I would say that the issue is that this is something that the church has probably just left undone. We've recently forgotten that we need to help people know better ways to interact with the scripture, and that is why we're here tonight. But before we get to that part, I need to be vulnerable with you about some of the less than helpful ways that I approach scripture left to my own devices. Because I think we need to acknowledge that not all approaches to spending time in the word are equally beneficial. And in fact, based on my own experience, I would argue that some are actually potentially harmful. So let's take a look. The first thing that I did, left to my own devices, trying to relate to the scriptures, is what I like to call the Xanax approach. So let's say that I was having a week where I was really feeling anxious. What would I do? Well, you know what I would do, right? I would just read Philippians 4, 6. I'd write it on a note card, be anxious for nothing, right? Okay, all right, all right, serenity now, serenity now. Well, what if I was feeling ugly, like say my pants didn't fit exactly right or I was having a bad hair day, what am I gonna read, ladies? Psalm 139, right? You're fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay, all right, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I know I feel kind of puffy, but the Lord, he loves me just the way that I am. (laughs) What if I'm tired? Y'all, girl, I'm so tired. Y'all, it's been a hard week. What am I gonna read? Matthew 11, 28. Come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Yes, that's what I need. Jesus, I need a nap. Never mind that that passage ends up with rest for your what? Souls. And that's a whole different kind of rest that Jesus is talking there about, not just being fatigued, but I don't care. I just need to feel better. It has been a hard week. And you know what? I wasn't just self-medicating with the scriptures. I was also distributing them to my friends like a total pill pusher. Oh, girl, are you tired? Well, listen, you need to read this verse again. Oh, I'm gonna put it on Instagram for you so that you can have it in a nice little frame and you can, (laughs) you are welcome, you are welcome. I'm so glad it made your day better. (laughs) What is the problem with the Xanax approach to the scripture? Well, there are many problems. Let's see if we can narrow it down. 
The main one is that it treats the Bible as though it exists to make us feel better. We ask the Bible how it can serve us rather than how we can serve the God that it proclaims. And what's the problem with this? Well, first of all, I would just point out that the Bible doesn't always make us feel better. Have you noticed that? Jeremiah 17, 9, anyone? Above all else, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Feel better? You're a wicked rascal. (laughs) The Bible doesn't always make us feel better. And that means that if I employ the Xanax approach enough and frequently enough over a period of years, I will ensure that huge sections of my Bible will remain unread because they fail to deliver an immediate dose of emotional satisfaction. The Xanax approach, it's terrible. I don't like that I did it, but there it is. And that's not all that I did. Would you like to know what else? So, you know, I just thought, hey, it's all good. I mean, the Holy Spirit inspired it. There's not like a bad part. So I guess I'll just go wherever I want. I call this the pinball approach. So I would just pull back the plunger of my good intentions and release it and send the the metal ball of my ignorance hurtling toward whatever passage it happened to hit. So it might land in the New Testament first and I'd read a little bit out of the Gospels and then maybe I'd bounce back to the Old Testament and get into Leviticus and be like, like, okay, that's weird. And so then maybe, okay, Psalms, I'll try, try the Psalms, you know. And, and I would just sort of ricochet around to various passages as the Spirit leads, which sounds so good, right? Don't I sound like I'm really into this and really spiritual? What is the problem? What's the problem with the pinball approach? Well, I would point out first that the Bible was not written to be read this way. The Bible is uh, a book, and then it is also 66 books within a book, and it was not written to be read this way. In fact, I would argue that virtually no book was written to be read this way. So think back to high school algebra for a second. Think back to when you were in high school algebra, and let's say that you walked into your algebra class on the first day of the semester, and you sit down, and there's your algebra text sitting on your desk, and you open it up, and you flip to chapter five, and you read a paragraph out of the middle of chapter five, and I mean, you really try to read it closely, and then you sit for a minute, and you let it kind of soak in. Now, how should that change my life today? And then you close your algebra book and you leave and and you come back. You come back the next day and you sit down and you do the same thing. But this time you turn to chapter 8 and you read a paragraph out of that and you go through the same process again, right? And then let's say that you come back the next day and you do the same thing and you come back the next day and you do the same thing and you do that for the whole semester. Let me ask you something. How are you going to do on that final? How good are you going to be at algebra? You're going to fail. Because that's not the way an algebra text is meant to be read, right? And it's meant to, you start at the beginning, it's building on ideas, it's pointing toward a main point, it's written by a particular person for a particular purpose at a particular time. So, here's the thing. The Bible is much more than just a book, but it certainly is a book. And often we treat it with less respect than we would give to a common textbook. The 66 books of the Bible are meant to be read as any book is by starting at the beginning, working our way through to the end. The people who wrote them under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit built their arguments. They arranged the text. They made things go in a particular order to draw a particular conclusion and to teach a particular thing. So the pinball approach is not great because it's only going to yield you a fragmentary understanding of a bunch of texts here and there, but no comprehensive understanding. But that was not all that I did. And this next one I'm particularly not proud of, but let's just get it out of the way. The other way that I like to interact with scripture, well, so, you know, I'm in college at this point and I'm worried because I have a lot of decisions in front of me and things that I have to figure out. And I thought, oh my gosh, well, God's word is living and active, right? So I began using it, using what I call the magic eight ball approach. You remember the magic eight ball, right? Do you have those? Did you have that? You know, you sit around for hours before you had cell phones and you'd shake that thing up and you'd ask it all kinds of questions and wait to see if signs pointed to yes. Okay, and so I'm like, you know, well, I don't know. Should I, should I, uh, should I date Craig or, or should I, I date Jeff, right? And he's like, well, I don't know. Okay. 
Okay, um, some trust in chariots and horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. Okay, Craig drives a Mustang. <laughs> and there's a horse on the front. But Jeff, he drives a Cavalier, and his bumper sticker says, God is his co-pilot. He trusts in the Lord, our God. <laughs> Call Craig up. Hey, Craig, God says I'm not supposed to date you anymore. So, the magic eight ball approach. What are, you know, any problem that you have? What is it? You know, what job are you going to take? Where are you going to live? What should, which house should you buy? Should I change my hair color? Shake that thing up, point to a verse, and see if signs point to yes. What is the problem with, you're, you're looking at me, but I know you've all done it. <laughs> so, what's the problem with the magic eight ball approach? Well, first, I would just point out that the Bible is not magical and it does not serve our whim. And when we treat the Bible in this way, we are demanding that it tell us what to do. And the Bible is actually primarily concerned not with telling us what to do in a particular circumstance, but rather with telling us who to become, who to be. Not only that, but when we use the Bible in this way, we're actually doing something that's pretty dangerously close to soothsaying, asking the Lord to tell us the knowledge of the future. And in the Old Testament, you remember what the punishment was for that? It was stoning, yeah. Yeah, so let's be careful with that. And it's interesting because there's something else that's revealed in approaching the Bible in this way. And I think it's that we say, I need wisdom from the scriptures, right? And so we come and we, we go through the magic eight ball thing and we're like, Lord, give me wisdom, give me wisdom. But let's be honest for a second. Are we really asking for wisdom when we approach the scriptures that way? What we're actually asking for is not wisdom, but knowledge. It's knowledge. Because wisdom is taking the facts that you have and making the best decision with the facts that you have. Knowledge is just the facts. So um, I think about this in terms of my own kids. So uh, my oldest son, he's, his name is Matt, and he's 21 years old. Now, he'll be home uh, uh, tomorrow, actually, for a little bit before he leaves for the rest of the summer. What if he came down to breakfast on Saturday morning and he said to me, Mom, what should I have for breakfast? Should I have the oatmeal or the eggs? Hey mom, should I wear the red shirt today or the blue shirt? Mom, should I drive to work or should I ride? And I'd be like, honey, pull it together. You're too old to be asking these questions. Because what does a good parent do to raise a child to maturity? You don't keep feeding them the right answers. What do you do? You train them to take the facts that they have and make the best decision. You want to raise children who have wisdom, who have decision-making skills and have wisdom. How much more so our Heavenly Father? Why do we expect that when we interact with the Scripture, He's just going to hand us red shirt, blue shirt, marry this person, marry that person? Why would we not assume that he is more concerned with having mature followers, those who have moved on from milk to solid food? So, magic eight ball, I don't recommend it. But then I got more clever. I engaged in a, 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 in a technique that I refer to as the personal shopper approach. So I would think, okay, I need to know how to be a godly woman, or I, know how, I need to know how to deal with self-esteem issues, or you know, how, to, how to get my finances in line uh, according to what the Bible says. But I'm not really sure how to find verses on that. So I am going to just let, insert famous big name Bible teacher here, uh, pull all that together for me into a study. I'm gonna let that person do the legwork for me because they know how to do those things, right? So this is the classic topical study. And there are topical studies available on all kinds of different topics. And strictly speaking, even if you were doing a study on something like the Trinity, if you were doing a study on a doctrine, it would be a topical study. So what I am not saying right now is that topical studies are not good for you. I actually think they're great. We need topical studies that can integrate for us broad concepts from across Scripture. So we need them, but I would just note that topical studies do not help us build ownership of Scripture, because what are they doing? They are taking passages and attaching them to the topic, whereas if you were reading through a book from start to finish, you would find that the passage is introducing the topic as it comes up in the text. So those are two very different things. And much like the pinball approach, they will yield you a fragmentary knowledge of many books of the Bible, but mastery of none. So they're definitely profitable. They have their place. But the problem is they're not foundational. 
Foundational study is getting just that firsthand knowledge of the text under our skin. And here's what I find. I find that over time, many of us have gotten into a pattern where we are completely given to doing topical studies and have set aside any attempt to do anything else that's a line-by-line study of the text. Because the topical study is just kind of neatly packaged in there for us. And over time, we've lost our sense of having sort of a balance between those things. But here's another thing that I decided to do (coughs) to interact with my Bible. I call this the telephone game. Do you remember that game when you were a kid? And the fun thing was you would whisper a phrase into someone's ear and it would travel around the room and how distorted it got by the time it got to the last person was what made the game funny. And it's super funny when it's a kid's game, but it's less funny when we start talking about getting into the scriptures. So let's say, for example, that you are, well, does anybody listen to podcasts, anybody read blog posts, all that kind of stuff? So we have a a steady diet and a lot of access to um, all kinds of commentary on the scriptures. So commentary doesn't just live between the pages of a bound book that you purchased in the commentary section of the bookstore. Commentary, a simple way of thinking about it is, it's what someone said about the Bible. Okay, which means that even the study notes in your study Bible are commentary. They're what someone said about the Bible. And here's what can happen in the telephone game. I began to prefer listening to sermons or reading commentaries or podcasts or blogs to actually spending time in the text itself. Because when I would spend time in the text, it was confusing and hard. And when I read commentaries, it made more sense. Or when I listened to someone else talk about it. So let's say that you're reading a a John Piper book. And in that book, John Piper quotes Augustine, and Augustine quotes the Apostle Paul. What do you think just happened there? You just read what someone said about what someone said about the Bible. And sometimes it's further removed than that. Sometimes it's Beth Moore quoting John Piper, who's quoting Augustine, who's quoting the Apostle Paul, and so on and so on. And we can get into a situation where we're reading what someone said about what someone said about what someone said about the Bible which begins to beg the question, at what point are we going to read the Bible, right? Now, it doesn't mean that when John Piper put that quote into his book that he misused it or that it didn't add to your understanding. It just means that what someone said about the Bible is only going to take on the meaning for you that it should when you actually know what the Bible says. Because if you spent any time with commentaries, Like, let's say you did go to the Christian bookstore and you bought three commentaries on the Gospel of Matthew and you laid them out side by side and you start reading them. Do you know what disturbing thing you're going to find? They don't all agree. So now what? Well, you're going to need some firsthand knowledge of the text. So the telephone game. We need to break our commentary addiction. And what that means for most of us is at least quitting cold turkey in the short term. It means when we come to the text, we don't read a passage and then rush to see what someone said about it. We wait and we try to gain firsthand knowledge ourselves because ultimately, I will not stand before God and give account for how well Matt Chandler loved God with his mind or John Piper loved God with his mind or Beth Moore loved God with her mind. I will stand before God and give an account for how well I loved God with my mind. So the telephone game, commentaries are absolutely profitable. They are profitable layered on top of a firsthand knowledge of the text. And then another thing that I did in my unhelpful ways that I approached the scripture, I like to call the Jack Spratt approach. You remember Jack Spratt, he would eat no fat and his wife would eat no lean. I cannot relate to, his wi- uh, to him at all. His wife's kind of right up my alley. This is when we engage in picky eating with the text. So we're like, well, I just really like the New Testament because the Old Testament, God's kind of scary. Or, you know, maybe the Psalms and Proverbs, but I just, I just don't go there. And anyway, the New Testament's where it all really happened. So I don't know. Or we read books with characters or plots or topics that we can easily identify with, right? The ones that seem the most accessible to us, and we go back to them again and again and again. So what's the problem with the Jack Spratt approach? Well, by its own report, how much of Scripture is God-breathed and profitable? All of it. So if it is true that all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable, 
hadn't we better try to work to spend time in all of it, all of it. I'm 48 years old, I'm not there yet. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to keep trying. I want to try to get as much of it in as I can because if it's all profitable, I do not want to miss out on the profitability of any of it. So what are the implications of this? Women, it is time for some of you to move beyond Esther, Ruth, and Proverbs 31. You got it, move on. Men, some of you might check out those books. You realize there are no pink parts and blue parts in scripture, right? Like there's not like, oh girl, this is our section. We'll let the men go over there and read about Gideon. It is all for you. We need the Old Testament to understand the New Testament. The Old Testament is what brings the New Testament to life. You know why? Because guess what all of the New Testament authors knew inside and out? The Old Testament. They want you to be thinking about it when they are writing in the New Testament. We need all parts of it. So I look back over my shameful practices and I ask myself, where was the disconnect? Like, where was the main disconnect in what is going on and, and, and what I was asking the Bible to do. And I think that if I could boil it down, it would be that I was asking the Bible to appeal to my heart. Now, what do most believers want? Like those of us who have, we, we, especially if you came out of a, a bad background and you're just so grateful that you're, you're a believer now, if I ask you, you know, what is it that you want as, as, as part of your Christian life? What do you want the yield to be? Most people would say, I want to know God's will and I want to be transformed. I don't want to be who I was anymore, right? Like I want the grace of God and the Holy Spirit working through me to transform me. I don't want to be that person anymore and I just want to know the will of God. But I think we have to ask the question, what is the path to that transformation? Like, how does that transformation happen? Does it begin with our hearts? So, what does Jeremiah 17, 9 say again? Above all else, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, I don't know that I want that driving the bus. Now, have you ever gone through a time of crisis? How reliable are your feelings when you are going through a crisis? Those son of a guns will lie and lie and lie and lie to you. Why? Because the heart's deceitful. It's desperately wicked. The heart wants what it wants, and what it always wants is not always what it needs, right? So is that where, do we just have to want to want? Do we have to want different, are we just supposed to want the different thing? Like, how does that even work? Well, thankfully, the scripture does not leave us to wonder about what the path to transformation is. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. Praise God, that's what I want. I don't wanna be conformed any longer to who I was. I don't wanna be that person anymore. What does it say next? But be transformed, hallelujah, that's what we want. We wanna be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. So yeah, do we have to want different things? Yes, the question is how do we begin to want different things? Well, I would urge you to consider that the path to transformation is through the mind to the heart. Why? Because if I wanna change what I love, I would point out to you that the heart cannot love what the mind does not know. The heart cannot love what the mind does not know. So I can't learn to love the better thing if I don't know what it is. And where do we find out the knowledge of the better thing? We find it out here. Because once your mind knows, your heart begins to be transformed. Maybe you don't believe me, let me give you a little illustration. I work here, this is where I work. My office is right back there. And sometimes I forget to bring my lunch in. But conveniently for me, or perhaps this is the most terrible thing that has ever happened, there is a Chick-fil-A located in the far corner of the parking lot. So over a course of time, I developed a perfectly happy relationship with the Chick-fil-A milkshake. Are you familiar with it? They have seasonal offerings. It's delightful. In the fall, it's the pumpkin spice. By Christmas, they're doing a little peppermint number. Then in the spring, they introduce the strawberry. 
What comes after strawberry? Who knows? Peach. Peach. Amen. (laughs) Peach is next. And I loved it. We had such a happy, happy relationship. Until a couple of years ago, when some moron at the FDA decided that it would be great to put the nutritional information (laughs) on the drive up. And then every time I would pull through that drive through and get ready to order my peach milkshake, I would look and see, and I would see, and then I knew. (laughs) And I knew what I never wanted to know, what I never would have chosen to know on my own. And the eyes of my heart were opened. And I quit the milkshake cold turkey except that I didn't. (laughs) But I did over time. Because once I knew what was in it, I could not keep going back to it. Because you know what happened? Once I knew, what began to happen to my desires? I began to desire the better thing. Our desires begin to be changed and redirected to what is good and right and true when we behold it. You know that that verse in the Psalms, Psalm 34, 7, it's one of the most misappropriated verses in all of Scripture. It says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. People love this verse. This is one of the ones you put on Instagram, right? Why do we love it? Because it sounds like if I just, you know, make a show of delighting in God, maybe I really even feel it, what's he gonna do? He's gonna give me whatever I want. That sounds fantastic. Except that I don't think that's what's going on in that verse. The person who delights in the Lord is the person who has beheld the Lord as delightful in here, right? And that person, the person who delights himself in the Lord, receives new Desires were transformed by the renewing of our mind and our desires begin to align with the very heart of God. We begin to want what he wants and when you want what God wants, guess what? He will give it to you. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. He gives us new desires. And what I began to realize is that many of my time in the word practices failed to transform because they were appealing to my heart with no regard for my head. They were appealing to my feelings with no regard for my reason. And my hope, my prayer for the church, for this church and for all churches, particularly as the culture shifts around us and the secular humanists and the false teacher make their inroads, my prayer for all of you is that you would have a reasoned faith, that you would have a thinking faith that is grounded in the fact of who God declares himself to be in his word. That's going to require that we begin to distinguish between devotional reading and study. That we begin to ask, okay, the time that I'm spending in the scriptures, is it actual study or is it someone going, here, here's a little neatly packaged thing. And when you get done with this, you're going to feel, mmm, and you're going to move on with your day. Because we live in an instant gratification culture, right? That would be pictured probably most clearly by me in the drive-thru at the Chick-fil-A. We want what we want when we want it, and generally speaking, we can have it. Like, when I heard that Amazon was piloting drones to see if they could drop stuff on my porch like 15 minutes after I imagined it in my head, I was like, I am totally for that. In fact, I would like them to get that technology into the hands of the Girl Scouts (coughs) (coughs) so that the cookies show up faster. We have a short-term mindset around so many things. We have an instant gratification mindset around so many things, and one of those things is this. And we have to shift our understanding. It cannot be that we take a debit card approach to our time in the Scriptures. It cannot be that we go, okay, I've got my 15 minutes in the morning, so I'm going to put my little debit card in, and I'm going to withdraw my little bit of mm 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 to get me through the day. Because, girl, if you don't start with Jesus in the morning, your whole day is shot. It's going to like speak a magical thing over my day because I went and I sat down and I had my little thing. Except what if that weren't the way that we thought about that time? What if instead of viewing our time in the Word as a debit account in which we would draw what we think we need to get through the day, what if we viewed it instead as a savings account? 
Because you're going to read the Bible differently if you do that. You're not going to ask it to give you anything, perhaps, in the time that you're able to give it in the morning. You're going to say, this is a savings account. I'm going to sit down, and I'm like in chapter 2 of Matthew. I'm working my way through, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to read it faithfully. And when I get to the end of it, I may not be able to draw any great conclusion out of it today. But I'm going to put that deposit into the savings account, and I'm going to trust that the Lord is going to yield a return on that at just the right time. Because think about that. Think about when you've been in crisis in your life, right? Think about when you've had the bad phone call or the terrible thing has happened and you're so locked up, you're so traumatized that the thought of even opening your Bible is overwhelming to you. What if it's in that dark night of the soul that the Lord yields up treasure to you that you deposited 10 years ago? Would that be enough for you? Because I think that's probably more illustrative of how our time in the Word should be working. Some of you have had that experience. Some of you know that that is the way that this can work. We must have a long-term view. We must view our time in the Word as a savings account versus a debit account. And before I hand things over to Matt, I want to say the most crashingly obvious statement that you will hear all night long, because I think it's another thing that we're going to need to keep in view. Are you ready for it? The Bible is a book about God. Peace be with you. (laughs) The Bible is a book about God. Now, I would guess that no one here would say, I do not believe that. I would say probably no one here walked in the room saying, no, it's not. And I would say that in my entire time of having contact with it, I have never thought that it was not a book about God. But you know what the problem was? I wasn't reading it as though it was. I was actually reading it as though it was a book about me. Okay, so you know that story of Moses uh, in the burning bush where he's in Midian and he's herding sheep and he turns and looks and he sees the bush and it's not consumed. And he says, oh, I'll go over there and see what's going on. And so he goes over to the bush and you know that the bush is a theophany, it's God, and God speaks to him audibly out of the bush, right? And says, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, God of your fathers, and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he clearly declares, just in case Moses is a little fuzzy from being up on the mountain too long, hey, guess what? I'm exactly who you think I am, and you know who I am based on how I identified myself. And then he declares his intention for Moses to go in and draw the people out of Egypt. He wants him to go in and talk to Pharaoh. Now, has anybody here ever said, if God would just tell me what to do, I would do it? Like, if he would just speak audibly to me, I would do it. Yeah. So, because this has just happened to Moses, Moses goes, great, when do we leave? Let's go get everybody out of Egypt. Except that he doesn't. What does he say? But who am I that I should go into Egypt and do this thing? And so because he has refused to do what the audible voice of God has told him to do, the sky opens up and a thunderbolt comes down and singes him right on the spot, game over, story's over. Except that that's not what happens, right? God is long-suffering, he is, he's patient with him, and God comes back to him, and, and notice what he doesn't say. He does not say, oh, Moses, you are a precious son of the king. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You've got this. You are enough. But what does he say to him? He says, but I will go with you. And carrying this beautiful reassurance, Moses trots on off to Egypt, except that he doesn't. He comes back and says, but who, who am I going to say sent me? What does God say? Tell them I am sent you. Five times in the narrative, Moses says, but who am I that I should do this? And God comes back and says, but I will be with you, but I will be with you. What's going on here? Moses is confused. He needs to understand that the success or failure of his mission into Egypt in no way depends on who he is and in every way depends on I am. Here's the thing. The Bible is our burning bush. It is a faithful declaration of the nature and character of God from its opening page to its last page. And we stand and we say, who am I, who am I, who am I, who am I, when all the time it is calling to us, I am. 
The Bible is a book about God, and we should read it as such. We should read asking first what it has to tell us is true about God, because as John Calvin says in the opening lines of the Institute, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of self always go hand in hand. There is no true knowledge of self apart from the knowledge of God. I can't properly understand who I am apart from seeing who he is. And what I believe that the church lacks with regard to wanting to study the Bible with the want to is we lack an understanding of the transformative power of a vision of God high and lifted up. And that is exactly what your time in the word will restore to you. I hear so often people saying, I want a fresh word from the Lord. Or, oh, I want to hear the, word, the Lord speak audibly to me. I want him, if he would just tell me what to do, I would do it. And I'm telling you, no, you would not, based on scripture, not just Moses, others too. Everybody has a favorite John Piper quote. Would you like to know mine? <laughs> if you want to hear God speak, read your Bible. If you want to hear God speak audibly, Read your Bible out loud. <laughs> Here's the thing that I encounter over and over again. Interacting with the scriptures, for whatever reason, that is the part of discipleship that we thought would be easy. Like, we understand that missions will be hard. We understand that sharing the gospel with a neighbor will be hard. We understand there will be costs to our finances, costs to the way that we live our lives, costs to our, I don't know, our clothing choices. I don't know, all kinds of costs associated, swear words we won't be able to say anymore. We got all these things that we think will be hard about following Christ. But for some reason, when we think about learning who God is in his word, we think, well, he should just dump that on me magically. But you know what the root definition for the term disciple is? Learner. Disciple is a learner. And closely associated with that word disciple is discipline. So I'm glad that you came here tonight because the discipline of learning God's word is profitable. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing us, dividing us and rendering us whole. So Matt's going to come and he's going to talk to you about what that looks like. This good, hard work which yields its fruit in season. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word which is a gift to us. Father, we repent of asking for a fresh word when the word of the Lord which stands forever is in our hands and does never grow stale for us. We pray, Lord, that you would teach us to be disciplined in our approach, that we would treat this book with reverence and with respect, recognizing it as a storehouse of treasure that you make available to us. Make it precious to us, Lord. Help us to be transformed. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Jen. So for my block, um, you'll, you'll need something to write on and with and your Bible. And so uh, John 15, uh, it was scrolling when you came in. If you got here uh, a little bit early, if you didn't, it was, it was scrolling. Uh, let, let me start my section just by saying this to you. One of the more um, mind-blowing truths in the universe is that the creator of that universe wants to talk to you. He, he wants to inform you and show you and speak to you. And, and maybe I could um, let us feel the weight a little bit about, uh, about that little sentence I just said by... Um, telling a story that's a bit of a humble brag. So I'm just taking the option. Most of you are from the village. Uh, I feel safe. Um, I, I've been the president of Acts 29 for seven years. It's a church planning organization. We have a large fundraiser every year in Dallas. And so that's coming up in two weeks. And so, man, I have just been grinding on this uh, fundraiser. Uh, it, it'll 
It's Thursday night, May 25th. You're not about to get invited to it. Relax, all right? Uh, and and I mean, I've just been working on it and inviting and gathering. One of the roles of a president is fundraising. And so that's what I've been working on. We're trying to raise uh, $1.5 million. And, and so I'm grinding. Uh, and then I, I see an email uh, in my inbox show up just um, late last week. So I open up um, that uh, email and here's what the email said. Um, Dear Pastor Chandler, uh, on Thursday or on Friday night, May 26th, you too uh, will be playing uh, at AT AT&T Stadium uh, on their Joshua Tree tour. Um, Bono has a small list of pastors he would like to get together with for dinner the night before Thursday, May 25th. Would you be able to make that work? Do you know what my answer is? No, I, I can't make it work. I mean, I'm, I've got response. So and sh- surely I'm going to get that invite again, right? Now, here's what happened. I, I felt two things. Uh, one, elation and one, words that shall not be spoken in church, right? Um, and, and yet here, here's, let, the reason I tell you that story is a kind of humble black is that Bono wanted to talk to me and that was kind of a cool deal, like a really, really, really cool deal. Like, I would skip probably anything else on earth if it, it, except for that. Um, and, and yet, he, here's, what, here's the truth about Bono. He, he's a human being. He's going to die. He's going to stand in front of God and give an account for his life. Amen. But you know who really wants to talk to me? Anytime I want to kind of lean in and hear? The creator God of the universe. And, and this is what you and I have been invited into. And so let me dive into this. We've got to talk about, you can't talk about the Bible without talking about the Holy Spirit. Um, you, you just can't because you can't read the Bible correctly without the Holy Spirit. All right, I, I said last week, if you were here for our um, Exodus series, we, we were talking about um, hearing the word, believing the word, and doing the word. And when we were talking about hearing the word, I, I said that the Christian hears the Bible differently than the non-Christian. Right? The believer hears the word of God in a way that's illuminated by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why you can turn on the Discovery Channel and hear a New Testament scholar um, really speaking things that are categorically false and unorthodox because he's approaching the word of God uh, without the Holy Spirit. So you can't talk about the Bible without talking about the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches us that it's the Holy Spirit that guides us into truth. It's the Holy Spirit that enables us to discern error. And it's the Holy Spirit that illuminates our minds with insight to understand and accept the truth. You cannot read the Bible correctly without the Holy Spirit. It becomes empty religious platitudes that don't transform Got to have the power of the Holy Spirit. What what does the power of the Holy Spirit work in the Word to accomplish? It combats sin. It causes spiritual growth. It reveals our true motives. And it conforms us to the image of Christ. The Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, is accomplishing those things. So it is, I'll say it, it is a mistake to ascribe to the Bible alone those things. It's the Spirit of God through the Word of God accomplishing those things. And then lastly, what's the purpose of God's word before we get into how to approach this, or at least a way to approach this? Uh, The purpose of God's word, it reveals God's nature, reveals God's character, and reveals God's will for his creation. So that's the purpose of God's word. So three basic steps that we're going to talk about tonight, Um, comprehension, interpretation, and application. My son, uh, 11-year-old, I was letting him read through my outline. He's like, oh, CIA. So I was like, oh, that's clever. I'll give you credit. Uh, So CIA, (laughs) comprehension, interpretation, application. Maybe uh, if you've done something like this before, a lot of times that first step is called observation. Uh, I I don't know that I really care for observation because it it sounds like you might see something different than's actually there. Uh, So I want to talk about comprehension. Uh, and, and I don't think, I think my section's a lot easier because I don't think I'm going to say anything new or mind blowing to you, right? Uh, like when we talk about comprehension, here's what we're saying. What does the text say? Like, what does it say? 
Now we can talk about a lot of other little things, like I, I think that you should have a place and a time that, that you consistently get to. Uh, I think if you don't plan this, it's not naturally gonna happen. Look around, I mean, you're not gonna find like this hour with nothing to do where all of a sudden you're like, you know what I'm gonna do? Dive into the riches of God's word. That's not coming for you. You already know it. I can look around the room. You know that's not coming for you. This is planned. This is a part of your rule of life. This is a part of rhythm. You're saying, I'm going to make this a priority. Here's where I'm going to put this. If you do not do this, you are already wasting your time here tonight. If you're not willing to go, I'm going to find an hour and I'm going to block it. If you're like, are you sure an hour is enough? An hour, a day, five days a week, over 20 years is going to yield for you a crop of fruitfulness that you probably can't fathom right now, right? And, and so it's not, there, there is no silver bullet here where you're going to get this thing downloaded like the matrix. Right? It's one bite at a time, one hour at a time, over a long period of time that these things are accomplished via the power of the Holy Spirit using the word. So we're talking about comprehension. What does it say? So step one, you ready? Read it. You got to read it. You probably shouldn't need to write that one down in your notes. Maybe you do, but uh, you're like, read. Okay. You, you, you should just be all right, right? So when we're talking about reading, here's what we're talking about. So, so let's chat for a second because you do read the Bible a specific way. You want to read the Bible carefully. You want to read it carefully. You want to read it repeatedly. You want to read it patiently. Don't, if I'm going too fast for you, I've got your journal so that we can actually do some of this with John 15 here in a moment. Uh, I can uh, email these notes to you if you're type A and just desperately need them. Um, but you're going to want to read it carefully, repeatedly, patiently, prayerfully, purposefully, and inquisitively. I want to, as much as I can at the Village Church, encourage your curiosity around the Bible to just explode. Like, what is that? Why is that there? What is that all about? That's weird. I've got to get to the bottom of that. Like, don't, don't you know that delights the heart of God? Like, I can tell you this, when, when I, I get really, really curious about something going on in my wife's soul and start to chase it and try to understand it and ask questions about it and try to draw it out and encourage it and rejoice in it, Things are really healthy and beautiful and fun in my marriage. And so for seeing in the Lord, what is that? What is that about? That's confusing. I wonder what to do with that. And I'm just writing it down. Like, like that's, that delights the heart of God. You're seeking, you're mining, you're wanting to know more about his character, wanting to know more about his nature. So be inquisitive, ask questions. And so after we read carefully, repeatedly, patiently, prayerfully, purposefully, inquisitively, we ask the right questions. So let's talk about that. Who is talking or being talked about? Right? So when you're reading the Bible, someone's talking. Right? Now, there, there are genres we'll get to in a moment where um, that, that, that doesn't carry as much weight, but, but somebody's talking and somebody's being talked about. You, you should make note of that. You should make note of that. Um, what is the subject or object being discussed? What comes before and what follows after? Now, again, if you're an English teacher... Or a history teacher. Right now, you're like, yeah. Right? Because this is, this is actually just reading to comprehend something. Where is the activity or discussion taking place? When is the activity or discussion taking place? Why? What's the purpose of the activity? How are the people involved responding and then here's some things to look for as you're reading carefully, repeatedly, patiently, prayerfully, purposely, inquisitively, and asking questions. Keywords or phrases, anything that keeps repeating itself, you're looking for. You're looking for the structure, how it's arranged. Like, like you're just kind of outlining or sketching out what you're reading. And then you're looking for, and, and I talk about this one a lot at The Village, um, you're looking for the atmosphere of the text. And, and I, I think that's, I, I haven't heard anybody else talk about the atmosphere of the text as much as it's super helpful for me reading my Bible. And here's what I mean by the atmosphere of the text. Like, what's the emotive state of the text? Uh, are the people in the text in doubt? Are they afraid? Are they filled with joy? Are they, I, I want to get a sense. 
it, as a part of comprehending what's going on in the text, what the atmosphere is. Doubt, joy, instruction, encouragement. And, and then I want to consider the literary form. Literary form matters. So you've got narrative and so narrative um, conveys history and truth in the form of facts, stories, parables, accounts, biographies, etc., from a theological perspective. That's Genesis, Exodus, that's the book of Acts. Then you've got discourse. And discourse is designed to present ideas, concepts, doctrines, or facts in a logical, orderly fashion, and often in the forms of argument, letter, lecture, sermon, or speech. This is Romans. This is the book of Ephesians. This is Hebrews. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Then there's poetry. Poetry involves primarily the expression of emotions, feelings, and ideas as a means of conveying truth. That's Job, Psalms, Song of Solomon, and then you have the prophetic that involves the use of symbolic language to reveal or uncover that which was previously unknown. That's Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Revelation. Now, um, I, I, want, I can't overstate this. Comprehension of the text has nothing to do with you. Look at it. It has not, we're, we're not about you just yet in our study. There, there's nothing for you just yet in our study. We want to know, what does it say? Well, what's going on here? Not, not what's going on here. We're going to get to that, praise his name. Well, what's going on in the text? What's the Bible saying? And so here's what we're going to do, because it's not a win for you to walk out of here tonight with some steps, but not believing that you can do it. Right? And, and so they're gonna, I'm going to have to ask you because of time to break some of the rules that I just laid out for you. And we're just going to be all right with that. All right? we're just, you and I, we're just going to be cool with it. You kind of know it's going to take more than 10 minutes uh, at uh, another time. But here's what I, I'm going to give you just 10 minutes. And we're going to look at John 15, 1 through 17. And as you read it, I, I want you to kind of do this, right? I, I want you to begin to comprehend that text, what it's saying you're reading it carefully slowly repeatedly you're not gonna have time to do it repeatedly so just go slowly and carefully once or twice through i guess twice would be a repeat read it twice through right and and then begin to look for keywords and phrases is anything repeated start to take note of anything you notice about its structure what's the atmosphere of it can you pick up on the tone and atmosphere of the text who is talking? Who's being talked to? What exactly are they talking about? What's the subject or object being discussed? Is there activity taking place? So I'm going to start my little timer here. When we hear stargaze go off, we'll know our time's up. So 10 minutes for comprehension. Let's go. Good job, guys. Now, um, I, I want to stop for a second and make you aware, like, I, I feel like one of the jobs that I have here um, is to consistently, as consistently as possible in 2017 when we live in which a world that's um, disenchanted is remind you that you're caught up in some pretty hefty spiritual realities here. Um, and so you will, this is my experience, you, you will fight um, a, a good period uh, of time wrestling with a wandering mind uh, and distraction, uh, a type of wandering mind and distraction that does not take place when you're looking at Instagram and does not take place when you're binge watching Netflix. And, and I'll tell you why, because I think the enemy has us where he wants us when the mind is off and unengaged from the word of God and our enemy, our very real and present enemy cannot have us digesting the word of God. It, it makes us powerful. Uh, it transforms us. It conforms us into the image of Jesus Christ. He is already um, defeated, uh, but is not going quietly into that lake of fire. Uh, and, and man, we start to dig in and feed off the word of God. A lot of his little tricks and, and, and things stop working he can't have that. So, so if you, surely you've picked up on the fact that, that you can um, do quite a bit of stuff without being distracted. But if you try to pray or dig in your Bible, then, then all of a sudden, gosh, you just can't seem to dial in. That's spiritual warfare. We'll eventually teach on that. That's not tonight. Let's talk about now 
um, interpretation. Now, before we jump ahead and make interpretation about us, interpretation is still not about us, right? So we've comprehended and now we want to interpret. When we say interpretation, we want to determine the meaning of the passage when originally written, right? So not interpret it. What does that mean for 2017? That's not the question yet, right? He wrote this to someone at that time. When they heard it, what did it mean? And so here's some general rules. Number one, interpret literally. Now, there's two types of literally, and, and let me give those to you. You've got plain literal. So I'll give you an example of that. God formed man of the dust. We just believe that, right? We just literally believe that's how man came to be, that, that, that God uh, made us from the dust and breathed life into us, right? Now, there's also figurative, figurative literal, and, and that would be Herod is a fox, right? He's not a fox, right? That, that's the apostle Paul saying, watch out for the dogs. He's not like, okay, look, Philippians, a lot of wild dogs out there. I'm just saying, you got to be careful of the wild dog. No, he, he's calling people, that, that's figurative literal. In the passage you just read, what was the figurative literal? Vines, branches, right? This is figurative, literal. Interpret in context. And so let, let's talk about this. I, I think interpreting in context is the single most important factor for correct interpretation. And, and so how do you do that? Like, again, if you're an English history teacher, you, you know this. Here's how. Verses, sentences, paragraphs, surrounding paragraphs, chapters, sections, books, Bible, right? That, that's what we mean by context. So how do you interpret this? Well, you look at the verse, but then you want to scan out and look at the sentence and then scan out and look at the paragraph and scan out and look at the chapter and scan out and look at the chapters and scan out and look at the book and then scan out and look at the Bible. And if you're like, all in an hour? No. <laughs> no, like I said, we're doing this, we're doing this an hour at a time for 40 years. And you will be stunned at what that does. I'm just saying, you will be stunned at what that does. We've been talking a lot lately at the village about just embracing the normal. You know what the normal is? An hour in the Bible. Not, not like I, not a lot at my little kitchen island thing. Not a lot of like, you know, fireworks that go off or, you know, the Holy Spirit just personally showing up in bodily form, sitting next to me like, what are you reading? Let me explain that to you, right? It, it's just working through it, pen, journal, context. So we interpret in context. So um, my least favorite or my favorite example of this is um, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Like, you know, that doesn't have anything to do with sports. I was so stunned <laughs> to read that in context when I first went through the book of Philippians. I was like, wait, he's not talking about basketball or football? No, he's talking about being content in wealth or poverty. Context matters. Otherwise, you slap that on the back of a T-shirt with a guy swinging a, a bat and you make it all about who? Like Jen said, us. No, no, it's about God being enough regardless of our circumstances. And that's better. And that's better, right? We interpret in context. Um, this one will be a little bit more difficult, so let's spend a little bit of time chatting about it. Um, we interpret in view of history and culture. So I'll explain that, and then I'll give you some rules that'll help us. Um, historical. Who's the author? When was it written? Where was it written? Why was it written? Who was it written to? What was the political climate, the economic climate, the social climate, the religious climate, the legal climate, the ethical climate? And if you're just like, not in an hour, bro. Not now. I, I think a good 
study Bible. And there's a lot of people when they talk about reading the Bible for yourself that are anti-study Bible. I, I'm not one of those. I think a good study Bible is really helpful. Um, just don't find out for yourself, wrestle a little bit for yourself, but before you dive down and you certainly don't have to wrestle about date and author, right? It's like, oh, I just want to just start and just figure this out without looking down. I know that God wants to speak to me here. When was this written? Right? You, you don't have to do that. You can just look down and use your study Bible. Now, cultural settings, because cultural settings, you, you are going to find more and more and more those who do not want to obey the historic Christian Orthodox faith are going to use the argument of culture to remove the authority from the word of God. If you're paying attention, you're seeing this everywhere. Now, that's not really what this was. That's not really what that means. See, what was happening in that period of time was to take away a clear command from the word of God that this way to life, this way to death. You see this consistently now on the topic of sexuality. You see it consistently right now in, in conversations about gender. Well, well, we didn't, they, they, that's not what they're addressing. They're addressing something else. So culture is huge. When we're talking about interpreting in view of culture, here's what culture is. Culture is what people believed, what they said, what they did, what they wore, what they ate, what they made, what they practiced. So here are some questions that you have to ask around the cultural piece. What was the purpose of the cultural practice or teaching? Like, what was its purpose? Again, a good study Bible will help you do this. We'll talk about commentaries. Commentaries will help you do this. I already saw one of the questions was, how do you find the best commentaries? And so we'll try to answer that question. It's really an easy one, bestcommentaries.com, but I don't have to answer that one now. Um, I'm not kidding. That's a really corny website name and a brilliant website. Um, would the cultural practice have the same significance today? We, we've got to ask ourselves that question. Is there a timeless principle? And then here would be the rule I think you should always default to. Assume every teaching or practice of scripture is applicable for today. Unless, three unlesses, the context restricts it. Don't make graven images. Don't do that. So that, that's kind of a cultural practice, and the text goes, yeah, don't do that, right? And this is what the Word of God does. It steps into every culture and corrects it, right? Second thing, later revelation overrules it. Who likes bacon? <laughs> then praise his name for progressive revelation, right? The dietary laws are an example of this, right? Uh, you read in the old day, he, here's what is unclean, and then Peter goes up on that blessed praise, the name of Jesus' roof, and we get ourselves some bacon. <laughs> it's clearly unique to that culture, right? I, and and I'm, I'll use one that's easy to see, right? Um, um, in Genesis Chapter 47, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but Jacob says to Joseph, come here and put your hand under my thigh and swear an oath to me. Like he, <laughs> you, if you're working through your little Bible reading plan and you're in Genesis and you read that, brother, you do not go put your hand up on somebody's thigh and make a promise. Do you swear you'll be there? Come here. <laughs> yes, I do. Like that's not, no, no, no. That, that, that is not... That is not what we do. In, in our culture, what's, what's the, um, what's the, it's this, right? It's a, I swear. Like, I swear. You, you've got my promise, right? So, so we, it's clearly unique to that culture, right? Now, interpret in light of the literary form. The form matters. You do not interpret poetry the same way you interpret history. You will find a lot of skeptics about the Bible point to poetry as um, a way to try to say the word of God isn't true, right? But they, but they would never do that with Ed, Edgar Allan Poe, you know, they, 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 right? And they're like, really a raven? Are you serious? He was rap, tap, tap, and I just refuse to believe that. <laughs> you're like, yeah, because it's poetry. There's something going on underneath it. So you don't read poetry like you read history, like you read, right? These are, yeah. So literary form matters. Scripture interprets scripture. 
Scripture interprets Scripture. The Bible will never contradict itself. So what happens when it does? It, it doesn't. So when it appears to, let your what in the world is that take over and dive in deep. Like I, I, I love when something like that flares in my own personal study because then I, I just got myself a little adventure. Let's get to the bottom of this. Let, let's figure out what's going on here. Choose, I'm going to try to help you here. Choose a simple, natural meaning over a more complex one. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody do this. They take something and it's like, couldn't it just mean what it said? Well, actually, this is it. You're just like, okay, man, you're like, you're like four points deep with 13 sub points under all of those points. And it looks like I should just love the Lord, my God, with all my heart, mind, and soul. <laughs> my whole being should love the Lord. Right? Just, just give in to a simple, natural meaning over a more complex one. The New Testament and the Old Testament help us understand one another. They are not different gods. They help us understand one another. We have got to get better at the Old Testament because it will help inflame our hearts for mission and the kingdom of God in the new. You cannot understand the new outside of the narrative in the old of what God's up to. Listen, I'll say that we don't have a lot of time. For this. You can't understand the parables of the kingdom without understanding in a very real way some of the things that Daniel taught on and why people were so confused when Jesus came not overthrowing Rome because the vision Daniel got of the coming Messiah was one that destroyed iron and steel that represented the nations that were to come. And so the people in the first century had been steeped in this Old Testament idea that the kingdom of God was going to come and just melt people's faces off. But Jesus comes and goes, no, 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 it's going to be like a mustard seed. No, no, you know what it's going to be like? The wheat and the tares, they're going to grow up together. It was disorienting. Whoa, aren't you supposed to destroy the wicked? Not yet. I will. But right now, the wheat and the tares are going to grow up together, side by side. So although victory has been won, the evil age is not over yet. Because of my kindness and mercy, it's like a mustard seed. It, it's, gonna, it's the smallest of seeds, and yet when it's done, the birds of the air will rest in it, right? We've got to get into the Old Testament. I, interpret unclear or ambiguous passages in view of plain, clear, central ones. I, I don't know if you've... Um, you've been around people that, that do this quite a bit where they get really hung up on this one ambiguous passage when there's like 10 like super clear ones on the subject, but it's this one they just can't let go of. And you're like, no, no, the Bible interprets the Bible. The Bible's helping you make sense of that Bible verse all over here. So use these to help you understand these, right? And then lastly, interpret in view of theological consistency. Test any proposed interpretation to determine its theological consistency. God does not change. He does not waver. So again, these are all opportunities for you to dive in. I've oftentimes um, talked about reading and feeding and digging in the word of God um, like I've, I've tried to pursue my wife's heart. Like, I, I, I want to kind of dig around in there and figure out what's going on. And, and anytime it's new, because I've been married to Lauren 18 years, that means I've been married to seven different women all in that body. <laughs> right? And, and then there are these seasons where I'm like, okay, this is new. I'm going to figure, get, to, get to learn this woman. This is awesome. And, and it's yet another adventure again to pursue her heart, to figure out why that's gone and why this is here and why. And, and it should be just a delight to dive in and go, oh, I don't understand this. But, but God's got the Holy Spirit in me. He's going to make it clear. I'm going to dig. I'm going to seek. I'm going to find. Um, uh, Luther said when he was um, preparing to teach the book of Romans that he laid hold of Paul and beat him until he submitted. <laughs> That's how you read the Bible right there, right? <laughs> like you read in Romans. You're like, what do you do with chapter 9? So Luther was like, I grabbed hold of Paul and beat him until he submitted. <laughs> right? Like that's, that's how you handle questions as you're reading the Bible. Now, special rules. Let's go over special rules just real quickly. Parables. Parables. Look around. Parables teach one key truth. They're not allegory. They teach one truth. So when you're reading a parable, so let's just take one. If you're reading the Good Samaritan, 
You're not trying to figure out what the hotel is all about that he's staying in. It's not the point of the parable, right? You're not like, oh, how many coins did he pay? What's the significance of that number? If I take that number and I plug it back into Ezekiel and divide it by how many chapters are in Isaiah, I know that the day the Lord is returning is this date. That's not what we do. A parable has a truth. Find it. Proverbs. Proverbs are principles. They are not promises. Proverbs are principles. They are not promises. They're just principles to give yourself over to because God has designed life to work in such a way that those principles most often bring about this specific outcome. But they are not promises. You can't hold God in contempt for not delivering upon you taking a proverb and saying, no, God promised me this. No, no, no. He, he's, not, he's not doing that. He's giving you a principle of wisdom by which to live your life. Um, when it comes to poetry, you need to examine the figurative language and the parallel structure to determine its meaning. In almost all Hebrew poetry, the second line informs the first. So if you're in Old Testament poetry, right, you're in Song of Solomon, uh, you're in parts of Job, you're in Ecclesiastes, the second line almost always brings clarity to the first line. So you want to dive into the figurative and parallel languages and then look at the second line to help you interpret the first. Then you've got to know there's a lot of symbolism in the Bible. You need to be prepared for symbolism because Jesus is the lamb, the lion, the rock, the branch, the root, the stumbling block. The Holy Spirit is water. He is oil. He is wind. He is a dove. The, these are symbols. Got to think rightly about prophecy. In, in prophecy, there's almost always, almost always a near application and a far application. So let, let's take Daniel and, and what I said earlier uh, about understanding the, the, the parables of the kingdom. When Daniel is writing in exile under the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, what he's writing has significant meaning for the people of that day, but also for us. There's a near application and a far meaning. Don't take the far meaning and reject the near application because there's truth in that near application. The other thing to consider around prophecy is that a lot of prophecy is progressive. It has been partially fulfilled, but not fully fulfilled yet. So we're in what, what we call the second advent, right? We're waiting for the second coming of Christ. So this is interpretation. What, what does this passage mean when it was originally written? Interpret literally, interpret in context, Interpret in view of history and culture. Interpret in light of the literary form. Scripture interprets scripture. And interpret in view of theological consistency. Now, let me do this for time's sake because we do want to answer some questions. Let me give you five minutes to, to work through a little bit of interpretation on your John 15. So you've observed some things. So now let, let's interpret some things. What does it mean? What's the significance of John 15? So answer those two questions. What does it mean? What is the significance of John 15? To the original here, we'll get to you in a second. That's a fast five. Okay, let's, let's talk application, because I know we want to go, okay, what do we do? So that's application. What do you do in light of what you comprehended and then from there, what you interpreted. Now the question is, what shall I do? So, so here's, here, here's how I think effective application works. And, and I think this is the big issue in the Bible Belt. I, I, I think, one, we, we don't know a lot like Jen, or, or what we do know is partial like Jen uh, described earlier in this. You know, it's the eight ball or the Xandax or, you know, it, it, we, we don't know a lot. And then what we do know, we don't apply. And, and so it's the application that's going to make all the difference in, in our transformation and joy in the Lord. So let's talk about that. He, here's some things to consider on effective application. This is a decision, not an emotion. 
This is a step of faith. I, the word of God has bid me in this direction, and I'm going to take that step of faith, which almost always requires a plan of action. Right? You, you've got to go, this is what the word of God says, this is what it means, this is how I apply it, this is my plan to apply it. Right? Or you're like what James wrote about the man who sees his face in the mirror but forgets about his face as soon as he walks away, which leads to deceit and decay. It's what happens when we don't apply. We walk in deceit and we start to decay. So there must be an effective plan to apply the word of God. So even, even as we started talking about studying the word of God, what is it? Man, you better have a time and a place. You better have a plan or it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You, you, you pile most people's lack of discipline with the level of spiritual warfare we're unaware of. You get a lot of people that are never going to read the word of God and just trust whoever's in front of them and what they're saying. Uh, obedience needs to take place over an, an appropriate period of time. And if you're like, well, what's appropriate? Um, y- you need to be obedient as fast as you can be obedient. Right? And, and the reason I, I wanted to put this here is because there are some conversations you shouldn't have over the phone. There are some things that don't need to be handled via text with a cute gif. They're face-to-face conversations that take a bit to set up and there are certain environments you need to be in. If repentance is your step of obedience, if confession is your step of obedience, sometimes you need to find the spot to do that. What I'm saying when I say um, an adequate time is you don't quit punting the ball down the field until you can numb yourself via of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It needs to be complete, not partial. It needs to be complete obedience, not partial obedience. Complete obedience, not partial obedience. And and I'm just going to preach this until my voice gives out. Not tonight, over the next 30, 40 years, if the Lord gives it to me. Mr. Rex, we'll be done in just a moment. Application is obedience, and obedience brings joy. Obedience brings joy. I'm just not going to stop saying everything God commands to do and not do is about his glory and your joy. He knows what's best. So to say yes to God is to line ourselves up, according to Jesus, with the fullest life possible. That's what, we, that's what we're being disciplined about, life into the full. Why are we going to take steps of obedience even when they hurt, even when we lose face, even when the projection of strength vanishes in light of our humanity, failures, shortcomings, lusts, anger, laziness? Why, why do we step into the light? Why do we walk in obedience? Because joy is on the line. Eternal life is on the line, and I'm going to step into it boldly, believing that the day will come where I'll have no regrets. The day will come when I have no regrets. So really what we're talking about here is a higher level of hedonism than the world operates in. What we're saying There's a greater pleasure to be had in full surrender to Jesus Christ than giving myself over to the longing of my stomach. And I'm going to mine for treasure. I'm going to find that treasure in the word of God. And I'm going to gladly and as best I can happily submit to that because there are some obediences that are difficult. Can we just agree on that? Like, I feel like 80% of the stuff God's ever asked me to do, I've been like, that's awesome. I'm in. I can see it. Yes. Yes. And then there's that dadgum 20% where I'm like, oh, I hope we don't get killed. I've got a pregnant wife. I'm moving to a church where everyone in my circle is saying they're going to destroy me or I'm going to destroy them. I'm flipping through the Bible going, where is Highland Village First Baptist Church? Should I go? Right? I mean, there's these steps of faith that we have to take sometimes. There's not a lot of clarity, but we're trusting the heart and character of God that we've learned about in 
the word. The stakes are unbelievably high here. I'm more and more convinced that if we don't get serious about this, which is why we do the Institute here now, it's why we're doing nights like this, we are going to get washed away in a wave of fine-sounding arguments with no weapons by which to defend ourselves. Our enemies are smooth. And the air we breathe has served as a kind of air war to soften the beach in ways we don't even comprehend. The shows you watch, the magazines you read, the music you listen to is all discipling you. It's normalizing things that are abnormal and unnatural. And we can't see it or feel it until there's an insane argument made and we're ill-equipped because we don't have uh, the sword of the Spirit handy and we're swept away in deceit and decay. So much is at stake here. Now, I, I want to just part with this. Look at me. You can do this. It's going to be clumsy. If you haven't been doing this, it's clumsy at first. It's clumsy. You're going to be done like, was that it? Supposed to do that? Yeah, over and over and over and over again. But what I've found is, is man, I, I, I can at times just get caught up and drawn in. Like, I, I want to get back to study. You know, I'm done in the morning, and then I got, I've got some meetings I've got to go to and things. And then I kind of keep thinking about that thing that I saw that I can't wait. I need to figure that out. I mean, that's my personality type. I need to know how it works. And then I find myself diving back in. It's just better than anything on Netflix. It's just better than House of Cards 7 or whatever. It, it is. You're going to have to do the spiritual warfare involved. You're going to have to have a plan. You're going to have to willing, be willing to submit to what you see in the scriptures. Or you numb yourself and you get swept away. So much more at stake than I think we even realize. Let me pray for us and then we'll move to Q&A. Father, I thank you for tonight. Just pray that it be helpful and anything that's not helpful. I just pray that as they leave this place, they'd forget and, and we'll edit out. So God, I just ask that even as we move into a time of Q&A, that some of the more practical aspects that men and women need to know to kind of figure out how this works, we could bring those to light. And uh, thank you that you don't ever leave us or abandon us to our own devices. Thank you that you long to speak with us, to eat with us, to dine with us, to speak to us. And we thank you that you have not hidden the word just for some sort of intellectual elite, but for all who will believe and trust in the name of Jesus. It's for your beautiful name I pray. Amen. Amen. Would you give Matt and Jen a round of applause? So uh, I'm a bit excited to ask this question because this is a question I ask myself sometimes. So I'm going to direct this to Jen first, and Matt, I'd love for you to answer it too. Uh, this is a question I would imagine many of us are asking. So I'm new to this. Where do I start? Uh, how do I know what to read? Let's just say it's Monday morning. I sit down. I open my Bible. How do I decide or know what to read and study? Start with Leviticus. It's <laughs> a good rule. General rule. Um, no, you're, you're going to want to choose, choose a book that's accessible. I usually tell people to start with one of the shorter books in the New Testament and get your, get your feet wet with it, just the way the process works. Another way you might choose where to start is if your church is doing a sermon series over a book of the Bible, follow Say along Exodus, with that. Like For Exodus. example, Exodus. Exodus. Yeah. Yeah, so try to align with what your church is doing uh, so that you're, you know, you're having multiple environments where you are encountering the text. And then in terms of like what's the first thing you can do, the, the most basic place to start is with repetitive reading from start to finish. That's, that's, the, that's the first place to go. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know that I'd answer anything different. I, I do love um, trying to read through the Bible in a year. Um, and, and getting a reading plan that has both Old Testament and New Testament readings. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so maybe you don't like that because you want... I don't, but okay. this, that's yeah, a preference that's, thing. That's a great, yeah. That's a so I like thing. both there. Um, and then the other thing I would, you know, I, I would kind of tr just try to gently press on is if you could do this in community, yeah, that you. makes a world of difference. So even like a church reading plan where you can reference to, hey, man, maybe, maybe you've been reading what we're reading. Here's what we've seen. And this is what you should have read this week. And that was pretty cool. And so if you can do it as a home group or you can do it uh, just in a, even as your family. Mm -hmm. um, if you're reading the same things and then having dialogue about it, that's really helpful. Yeah. I would say one of the most common 
responses to a talk like this that I often get is, oh great, now I can go do this on my own. And I always wanna go, wait, no, that wasn't the point. The point is, yes, that you should be able to do this on your own and you should do this in community with people who are co-learners and then you should also sit under teaching. Um, this happens corporately and it happens individually and you need both, so keep that intention. That's great. Uh, I imagine this has, been, this has happened to many of us too. Sometimes you're sitting under a teacher perhaps that is almost making the Bible feel inaccessible to you. Like they're trying to, <laughs> to make it. Yeah, I heard a quote once. That sometimes, sometimes preachers make the Bible more riddle than revelation. And you're like, what did that just say? I don't know what's going on there. So sometimes we have teachers who can make the Bible feel like this is inaccessible. Sometimes it's by using technical language, by using Greek words. And so, and so it, how, how can we make the Bible uh, accessible, or how can we gain the proper tools, perhaps like even just basic literary tools to understand how to read the Bible? Jen. I always like to remind people that the reason we have a Bible literacy crisis in the church is because we have a literacy crisis in our culture. People don't just not know how to read the Bible. They don't know how to read, usually. And I don't mean that they can't like read a sentence. What I mean is they don't know that you would read any book for comprehension, interpretation, and application. And so I point people back to, hey, we're asking you to utilize tools that you probably learned in your high school English class. And we're saying that if you will carry those to the text, it is going to open it up to you uh, as the author intended for you to, to read it. Yeah, Matt, anything to add? Um, the only thing I would add is that we've tried to make it a goal in our family to make reading comprehension like a, a reward-worthy effort. And so the illustration I would use is uh, for Audrey to get uh, her phone when she wanted her phone. I made her read uh, a book on the effects of technology uh, on the brain and the family dynamic and made her write for me. I mean, you can giggle. Your house but, sounds fun. Oh, <laughs> you, you? Really? You want to do this, Jen Wilkin? Do you, do you forget I don't know you? We'll talk that. Just my kids didn't come out smoking a pipe reading Hamlet. All right, I had to train them. Um, what kind of the, pipe? Uh, was that too far? That was, another, that was a birth joke. Um, so we had Audrey read that book, and then she had to write twelve sentence um, summaries of the chapters, no fluff sentences. So she couldn't, about what she learned in that chapter. So she couldn't write, I really like that chapter. I just drew a line through it. That's not a real sentence. Uh, what did you learn from the, and then when she completed that, we wrote up a contract and she got her phone. But I could give a couple more examples where I'm just trying to get them to just know how to read something and tell me what they read. Um, and, and then, man, we just take that right to the Bible. I would say that what I see so often, and particularly among women, but not limited to women, is that we approach the text um, ho wholly with our feelings. We've forgotten how to have a, have a thought level discussion around the text. And so it's a, it's a relearning of a discipline uh, of having that thought level discussion as though you were sitting in, in a classroom at school. Like, can you imagine sitting in your math class and going, well, I just really feel like algebra is speaking to my soul today. You know, like, no, no, no. Never Algebra spoke to my soul. may move you. It may make you weep. It certainly made me weep. But, but you start with, you know, let's have the thought level discussion. Uh, so this is a question I'd like to ask. And given what you just talked about, bringing kind of families into this conversation. Yeah. So I have a two and a half year old son. Got a little girl on the way. And you guys have grown kids and growing kids. How do you start including children into these kinds of, kind of rhythms of comprehension, interpretation, and application? Apparently at his house you take their phone away. <laughs> Do you really want to do this with me? <laughs> so you, like, you know I have weekend services. All right, go ahead, okay. go ahead. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we, we just started day one. And, and the Bible has just been a part of our world since day one. And that it's looked different in various seasons. And what I love about the resources that the village has done, specifically that next gen team, mm -hmm is they've made all of that really, really accessible and made me look super creative when I wasn't. So um, um, building a fort in the living room and getting in and reading about the Lord being a strong tower and talking about what that means. They're like, I didn't do that. That was just like on the sheet that I picked up when I picked <laughs> yeah. up the kids. And, and so we've done Advent together as a family. We've done, and all that's resources that the church created yeah. that we're just getting and they help us do that. Um, and so it's increased as they've gotten older. And so right now, um, Audrey is doing a Bible study with my wife and with um, a, a young woman who lives uh, with us. Uh, and so on Tuesday nights, they head upstairs for two hours of, of walking. She's got homework she's gotta do, and the phone is on the line for that. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, so we've, it's increased as they've gotten older, and the Bible's just a, we talk about the Bible a lot. We apply it a lot. 
Jen? Yeah, I think the modeling piece was really important. I remember at one point Jeff realized that he was, he was doing his time in the Word at a time when the kids were not awake. So he moved it to a time when they would see it. And in my case, I'm kind of always sitting around, you know, doing something uh, related to that. And so we never said, hey, you need to have a quiet time. That's not our parenting style. I think it's fine to do that. That just wasn't our go-to. We we tried to model it. And then we did have family devotional times where we would sit down. And my version of that was a little too much. And Jeff would say, hey, 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 what if they just came with two observations and two questions? I'm like, well, I mean, you know, no one's going to get a scholarship based on that. Uh, but he was right. It was to, get, it was to draw them into a discussion, uh, you know, that was a, a thought level discussion. And, and, and honestly, that, that question asking piece is huge because we, we kind of have this attitude of, well, it's the Bible. I can't ask a question about it, right? And so just to start imbuing into your children the idea that, hey, in order to think critically about what you're taking in, you're going to have to ask questions and know that the text can bear your questions. Mm, yeah, that's good. That's really good. Uh, I want to ask two more questions. Uh, the first is this. What is, or if there is one, a difference between devotional reading of the Bible and maybe more like an academic, studious reading of the Bible? Is there a difference, and what is the difference? Matt? Jen? Oh. What, Matt, uh, 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 Matt? Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> um, I, I want to study devotionally. So that, that's just how I'm going to answer the question. I, I, I think what you could probably get to is... Um, Maybe you've got a shorter window in this season, this week, you've got a shorter season, so your devotional study goes from an hour to 25 minutes or 20 minutes or 15 minutes, and then you just got a little devotional going on there, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I have never been the guy, like I, I was taught early on, you need to have a devotional life, and then you need to have a, a preaching study life. And I just could not more categorically reject that. Yeah. That means I'm approaching preaching as though it was an academic exercise and I'm approaching the Bible and devotional life to feed my soul. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not. I, I want to study in a very devotional-like manner. I need it to speak to me before I can tell everybody else this is what's going on here. Yeah. How do you handle that? So I totally agree with that. That's been my experience too, is people want to know, yeah, but like what, you know, they think those are two separate things and they're not. For me, study leads to devotion. But I do think we should acknowledge there is a category of, uh, in the publishing world known as devotional material. And I think you all know what it is. And uh, it's not... It's not bad by definition, although, can we just be frank, a lot of it is very bad. It's just, it's just kind of maudlin. Uh, but devotional material has its place, like say you wanted to do a devotional um, study over the course of Lent, right? So that's great. I'll tell you this, though. It's going to mean a lot more to you if you understand the context of each of the passages that's being pulled in for you to have your devotional time with, and you're going to be able to determine then in that case which devotional materials are the better ones and which are the, the less good because you have the foundation understanding of scripture. Love that. I want to be sensitive to your time, but I, I do want to ask one more question to both of you. So we've now talked about the problem of biblical literacy, why this is such an important deal in the life of the church uh, across church history, but even kind of more acutely today because some of the problems we're facing. We've talked a little bit about how uh, we can approach this problem, but I'd love uh, to hear and for, for you to have an opportunity to share each of you. So, so what's next? Like if you could kind of give us a charge or a, so what should we do now that we walk out the doors? Help us. It takes time to grow in comfort with, with these processes. And so if you wanted to learn how to play the piano, you might try to self-teach yourself using a YouTube video, but you would probably go find someone who could help you. And the first time you practiced, you would not be good and you would hate yourself and say you were a moron and not want to go back. But if you went back and you did it again and again and again over time, you would develop an aptitude. So I would urge you that while you're in the stage of feeling how much you don't know, the extent of what you don't know, and I don't know that you ever leave that behind, but you know, at, at the outset, um, get yourself somewhere that can provide you some structure and some accountability. And, and, and in, in the village, we do that through classes. We have the Bible classes, the men's and women's Bible classes, which are gonna take the principles that you just heard Matt talk about, and they're gonna, they're gonna help you put them into practice. So what they're not going to do is tell you how to interpret the text. They're gonna ask you to start using the tools. They're gonna help you begin to unpack it, because that way, when you sit under teaching in those classes, you've already spent time in the text. You will hear teaching so differently when you have spent time in the text 
first. So try to get yourself uh, into an environment. You know, if you wanted to become a doctor, you would go get some training. If you want to, this is a this is a form of training, and so we've built out environments to help you with that. And many local churches have. If you're not from the village, you can you know seek out those opportunities. Yeah. Yes, and amen to every word there. Th this is where I'll I'll go. You you need to look at your phone after we dismiss. Find 30 minutes tomorrow where you can get alone all by yourself, just you. You should probably tomorrow turn your phone on airplane mode, go tactile, get an actual Bible and an actual journal. Not, not, I, I would not tempt myself with my iPad until you detox a little bit. <laughs> and then I would spend 30 minutes reading, or I would spend 15 minutes reading the Gospel of John. At the end of that 15 minutes, I would stop and then I would go back and read wherever you got to again. And then 30 minutes of reading the, the Gospel of John, I would think through some of the stuff that we just walked through. Like, like what we just walked through, that, that's not, it, it happens a lot more quickly. So you, you just start with 30 minutes tomorrow and hop in the Gospel of John. But that means when we're done here, you need to find that 30 minutes. You will not find it tomorrow. You will find tomorrow's 30 minutes tonight. And so you find that, block it, 30 minutes, Gospel of John, dive in. I've already said it'll be a little clumsy. You might finish and think, is that it? And here's what I want to encourage you. The next day, find another 30 minutes. You don't have to start at an hour. You don't. You, let's just start to crawl and stumble. And, and men, when you come across that text that every stream uh, of evangelical life has a word for what happens. Illumination, it jumped off the page. The charismatic said, I got a word. And you, you, you just take that and, and man, write on it and go back and read it again. And let's just dive into the gospel of John. If you're not doing anything right now, find 30 minutes, gospel of John, dive in, clumsily move forward, lasso in your wife or husband, lasso in some group leaders, uh, group members, some friends, I need to get better at this. I'm terrible. If, you, if you've got that projection of strength going on, stop it, right? Like, it's okay if you don't know the Bible. Just say, I don't know the Bible like I'm pretending to. I'm just regurgitating stuff I've heard. I want to stop that. Will you help me stop that? And you're going to experience the grace of God through another saint who will say, oh my gosh, me too. Let's read John. And, and then dive into John. 30 minutes tomorrow. You're going to find that 30 minutes tonight. You won't find it tomorrow. Gospel of John. Amen. Hey, thanks again for coming. Hope this has been helpful and beneficial for you. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, let me just wrap up by, by uh, thanking the Lord for this time, praying for us, and then you'll be dismissed. Father, we, again, we are grateful for this. We're grateful that you have done one of the most imaginable things possible. You have made yourself known to us in the scriptures. And for that, we could not be more grateful. Help us to be a people who just devour them, who consume them and love them, that we might be shaped and formed and transformed into the image of Christ by them. Let us treat scripture as what it is, you speaking to us. I pray that every single person in here would just have an overwhelming uh, desire and passion to know you better tomorrow than they did today, and that, that passion would continue for the rest of their lives. We're grateful that you love us and that you care for us in Christ and that in him uh, we see the fullness of God and that in him we've experienced reconciliation, redemption, and the forgiveness of sins. We pray these things in his name and by the Spirit. Amen. Thank you.